Hey, so today uh, we will discuss the chapter about joints and the learning objectives are to identify keys to connect a pair of data frames, to use mutating and filtering joints to combine data, to understand how joints work, and to understand how various key matching conditions work. And so this may be uh, new terms in part, but so we all uh, have a look into it. So joining two data frames, it will always be called X and Y in this chapter. Joining two data frames X and Y is combining the information from these data frames to create a new data frame by matching rows in X to rows in Y. And this is based on one or more common variables, which we call keys. So this is the general idea. And a join, it is the operation of joining. So joins, they can be classified by several criteria. Um, first of all, is the information of data frame Y included in the result? So if it is, we call it mutating joins. If it is not, it's just used to filter the X data frame, then it's a filtering join. Another um, criterion is what happens with non-matching rows. Are they kept or are they not kept? And for the mutating joints, this will distinguish inner versus outer joints. For the filtering joints, this will distinguish semi-join versus anti-join. A third um, criterion is how are key matching conditions defined? So what defines a match between two rows? Is it an equality condition? Is it an inequality condition? And Perhaps there are no restrictions. So this is actually an overview of what we are going to discuss in uh, these slides. So keys are the variables used to connect a pair of data frames in a join. And the key in the X data frame must match the key in the Y data frame for a row in X to be matched to a row in Y. So the values of this key variable um, in the row uh, at hand must match between the X and the Y data frames. And a key, it can be one variable, but it can also be a set of variables, in which case we call it a compound key. Every join involves a pair of keys. So it's one key in each data frame. And keys typically play a different role depending on the data frame they're in. Um, what you generally have is that uh, one, of the, one of the keys in the pair of keys is the primary key of the data frame it uh, is in, which is uh, the variable or the set of variables that uniquely identifies each observation in that data frame. So it's generally the definition of what type of records that data frame holds. While the other key in that pair of keys, which belongs to the other data frame, is then typically a foreign key, which is actually the variable or the set of variables that yeah, matches the content or the meaning of the primary key. So it's uh, generally also the same number of variables. And its values can be repeated in that data frame because it's not the primary key of that data frame. So this um, picture, which is uh, the type of picture uh, used often in the book, is um, it shows the two data frames, the X data frame, the Y data frame, and the matches are um, depicted by these colored dots. So the key variable is um, the the variable with the numbers uh, one, two, and three in the X data frame. And this is the primary key of this data frame. So it has a, a unique value for each row. And when we use an, an equality uh, condition, matching condition, you will see that in the Y data frame is the first row that matches the first row of the X data frame, but is the second and the third row that will match the second row of the X data frame. So they can be repeated in that uh, data frame, the foreign key. In the New York Flights 13 package, um, we can see that there are different data sets, data frames, which have 
uh, each their own primary keys. So for example, airports, it has the FAA variable, which is the primary key. So it's unique and it will define each airport abbreviation. Um, the planes, it's also a primary key, which, which is just consisting of one variable. It is the tail number of the plane. The carrier uh, variable is the same for the airlines data frame. Uh, while in the flights and the weather data frames, you have compound keys, which are compound primary keys. Um, so in the weather data frame, it's the combination of time, hour, and origin, which um, refers to an airport which is it's a combination which makes each record unique uh, while in the flights data frame is the time hour the flight and the carrier variables which um, make the compound primary key and you can see the relationship uh, depicted with these arrows for example airlines the carrier goes to carrier in flights so here is the primary key while there if, you, if this would be a join, it would be the foreign key because simply the variable carrier can be repeated in the flight data frame. It's only the combination of those three variables which, which uh, makes the primary key in that data frame. So it's the same for others. We have one special um, one here because the FAA, it's just a list of airports abbreviations, but the origin and the destination variable in the flight data frame, they both uh, list airport abbreviations. So um, the from and the to uh, airport um, abbreviations for each flight. And so you can either join it to origin or you can join it to destination, but it's each time a foreign key relative to this primary key um, in each join. So in practice, we will just make one join in turn. So this, this the diagram, it shows multiple possible joins that you could make, but we will uh, make one join at a time in R. So some tips, joining is will be easiest if primary and foreign keys have the same name because then, well, there's some uh, automatic matching and you also just have to say it once. Um, also, it's important to not just assume that some variable is the primary key, but also check whether it uh, really honors that condition because each value must occur only once and there must be no missing values in a primary key. So both of these are important to check. Then there's a special thing, the surrogate key. It's actually, typically it's not something present yet in a data frame, but it's something that you add yourself. It's a single variable that you can add to reflect a compound primary key by just um, one variable, which then typically will be an, a number and a unique number for each row. So, and this will make life easier because then you can use just that single variable as a primary key in your joints. So let's have a look at flights and check whether these three variables together can constitute indeed the primary key. And it's true because the combination of those three variables is unique. There are none that have counts uh, larger than one no combination larger than one. And we can add here a surrogate key by just using the dplyr function row number. So then you'll get an ID column one, two, three, four, et cetera. And yeah, you can then use that instead of the actual primary key and it is a surrogate key. So mutating joins, they add columns from data frame Y to the X data frame. And we have an inner join, which only keeps rows that match, which respect the matching condition between the key in data frame X and the key in data frame Y. While on the other hand, you have also outer joins, which also keep non-matching rows from X in case of a left join, from Y in case of a right join, or from both. Let's uh, have a look at these very nice diagrams from the book. In the inner join, you can see that then 
only in the resulting data frame the attributes and the key values are retained um, for um, yeah for the rows that actually have the match. While in the case of a left join, the left join means that the left data frame, so the X data frame, um, keeps all its rows. So you have one, two, and three, even while the key value three does not occur in the second data frame. So you then will get an NA value for the attributes that come over from the Y data frame. So left join means keep my X and just um, join the Y attributes where possible, where does it match? Uh, but always keep the X data frame. In case of a right join, is the same, but for the Y data frame. So it says, keep every row of a Y data frame and fill in the X attributes wherever there is a match between the keys. So then you can get an NA in some of the X attributes because for, in this case, the key value four, there's no uh, matching um, key value four in the X data frame. So this, is when we, of course, use a matching condition that uses equality. But for now, we will just use that. And the full join combines both cases of the, so it's the left and the right join superposed. And then you can, you will, you will retain all rows from the X and the Y data frame, but where there's no match, you will get an NA either in the X or in the Y attributes. Some examples. So let's just uh, first make uh, a flights two data frame with uh, a limited set of variables as in the book. And then we uh, do a left join with airlines. So airlines is just a data frame which has the carrier and the name of the carrier. And what you can see, it says it gives a message. It's joining with um, the join by carrier. So it uses carrier as the key uh, in the join. And it does that because the carrier name is the same in both data frames. So it's just recognizes by default which, uh, which variable names are the same. And so it will just show it once uh, because it's, it's always the same. So this is actually the X data frame. And this is a single extra Y uh, variable that is added. So the Y data frame actually has carrier and name, so the key carrier is common between both and can be used to make the join. Because we use a left join, we, we really force it to keep all original rows of the X data frame. So if we look back at the X data frame, flights two, it's just this number and we just have the same number. What happens if we do the inner join? Well, in this case, we still have the same number. What does it mean? It means that, well, there were no rows in the X data frame that did not have a match with the Y data frame. So in other words, all carriers in the flights data frame were present in the airlines data frame. So that in an inner join, you still have all uh, rows of the X data frame. Of course, it may be that there were airlines in the airlines data frame, carriers that are not present in the flight data frame, and these will be dropped. You cannot see that here, but that could be the case. You cannot distinguish it from the um, output given here. And an interesting argument to check that actually is to use the argument unmatched. So by default, it's if it, um, it's set as drop when you just don't use it. It's set as drop and the unmatched, uh, it, it's, it says, what should I do regarding non-matching records? So actually they will always be dropped, right? It's not that the left join, right join and inner join behavior will change because of the unmatched. So it's, they will be dropped in the case of um, non-matching rows. In the case of a uh, left join, it will only happen for the Y data frame. In case of the right joint for the X data frame. And for the inner join, it will happen for both, as we have seen already. 
but you can also set it to error. And that's very interesting because then you actually want to verify that no records are dropped, even in the ones that would be dropped uh, by default. So if you would set unmatched to error in the left join, it would error in case that in the Y data frame, some, some rows are being dropped because they don't have a match with X. So in the left join, you have you keep all rows in the X, but you join whatever possible from Y. But if unmatched is set to error, you will get an error that in case that some rows were dropped from I and did not have a common value with X. And that would be, you would do that if you actually um, want or at least would expect from the setup from for your for your of your data sets yeah that they should not that no rows should have been dropped so if you set an error explicitly then you can take more control and and capture um data that are going to be lost by making the jump so i think it's very powerful to use Another argument in the mutating join functions, it's uh, the keep argument. And this essentially, if you set it to true, it will force both keys to be retained in the output. I mean, both keys, the X and the Y key, even if they are, well, just having the same name, but still it will be um, retained. So if we, for example, for an inner join set keep is true, then you, and see that carrier is repeated twice and it's uh, distinguished by adding the dot x and the dot y um, suffix in the variable name. And yeah, that, that might be interesting uh, to have a look uh, to do that. And well, if you do not mention it in case of equi joins, which is the which use the equality matching condition. Well, they will only retain the key from X, which we have seen already, but in non equi joins, uh, they will retain both keys by default as, as if uh, keep uh, would be true. We will see that uh, a little later. Uh, okay, so relationships and mutating joins. Describe how many rows in, uh, yeah, the X uh, do match with, or expected to match with um, how many rows in the Y data frame. So you can have four possible combinations. It's one to many, many to one, one to one, and many to many. And this is actually dictated by um, keys being primary or foreign in the X and the Y data frame. So let's have a look at these. These diagrams are not, in the book chapter, I suppose not anymore because they were still present in the repository, in the source code repository of the book. And that I saw that in previous versions of the slide, they were also being used. And I think, especially for the relationships, it's interesting in the current edition of the book, the relationships there, it's actually just the many to many relationship, which is very explicitly focused on, uh, but yeah, I think it's good to know about these four possible cases. So usually you will have one to many or many to one. So the one to many, it means that when you have the primary key here, so in it's in this case, it's a bit, um, yeah, a, a little bit confusing that they are using the uh, Y, um, attributes here. I, I actually think this might be um, sort of um, didactical mistake, but anyway, uh, here it says primary key is an X, which means it's the left hand data frame. So in the left hand data frame, we have a primary key and we have the foreign key in the right hand data frame. So that's what we have seen already, but nothing uh, is, is wrong with using this data frame as the left hand and this data frame as the right hand, which is then the uh, many to one case when, where you will have the primary key in the uh, Y data frame. So 
in the right hand data frame, I should actually say, but in this case, it's uh, it's the same. It's a Y data frame indeed, which is here at the right hand side. And well, it's the same behavior. The only difference will be that it's always uh, the columns from the left hand data frame that are shown first in the result, and then uh, the um, columns of the right hand data frame are being added. So this is the many to one case, but you can also have one to one. For example, in this uh, right join case, it just means that keys that match, yeah, they occur only once in this data frame and in this data frame. So in, in both data frames, they are unique. And the many to many means there are no primary keys involved. You have you are matching keys that have repeated values in each of both data frames. And this could be tricky. You, as you can see, this will, in case of each method, will give you all possible combinations of the rows that are matching. This may be intended, but it could be unintended. It could be a fault, and therefore you will give you will get a warning. So to, if you want to avoid the warning because it was intentional, then you can add the relationship argument and set it as many to many. So this, I think a couple of years ago, this was not yet in place, this behavior, but it has uh, popped up for quite a while already. And uh, it also shows in the warning, if it's intentional, you can just add relationship equal to many to many to avoid the warning. But it's good, I think, that the warning is there because indeed this is a more complex situation and it maybe you did not want it to happen. So you can take control of the expected relationship. And in production code and in the documentation of mutate joins, uh, it is actually recommended to always set the relationship argument to one of those four, uh, one of the four, one of those four um, states that are possible. So the one to one, many to one, one to many, or many to many, just to check that your expectation is met regarding this relationship. All right, that's the mutating joints. Then we go to the filtering joints, but if there was any question or remark, just uh, interrupt, it's no problem. Filtering joints, they will filter X based on matching or non-matching rows in Y. So they do not add columns from the Y data frame. And as a consequence, they also never duplicate row because yeah, no rows have to be added from another data frame. So they never duplicate rows. There are two uh, types. There are those that keep the matching rows, which is in this case for an equijoin. It's the key value one and two, so the first two rows. So the output is just a subset of the X data frame, notably those that have key values that are present in the Y data frame. So this is a very interesting way to filter a data frame. Another way to filter your data frame is give me all the rows that do not occur according to the key variable in the Y data frame. So this means, yeah, we just keep the third row in this case because all the others have values in the key variable that are present in the Y data frame. So in fact, this is also sort of mid between, you could say a left join and an inner join in uh, in in change uh, in a change way in the so in the left join you would keep all of them in the inner join you would select uh, only these and so it's the subtraction so it's it's if you there's actually a difference between the left join and the inner join it will give you the anti join so it's something I use uh, a lot anti joins because it's a very interesting one to check well whether all values in one data frame are present in the other and vice versa so anti joins are very helpful to do that let's do let's use uh, have a look at some examples so 
we have the weather data frame. Actually, it has a compound primary key of two variables, time, hour, and origin. But well, we just follow the default. We don't provide key variables in the code yet. And it will join by year, time, hour, and origin. OK, it works because you know, th those three variables are common, but they mean the same in both data frames. And OK, we have a subset. So it's a lower number of flights, a subset of the flight data frame, notably those for which the year, time, hour, and origin are uh, represented in the weather data frame. So we are just uh, filtering the flights to data frame. We could also make the anti-join. And then we have the subset that was omitted in the previous slides. And this means that these are all the flights for which we have no weather data. All right. So like I just said, we did not yet specify join keys. And then the natural join is applied as yeah, as, um, as um, I said in the messages that are shown by R. But yeah, it's a risk because you can miss key pairs that have different names anyway. So some uh, have different names as we have seen in the Nick Flight 13 uh, package. And also if you use the natural join, that would also assume that any pair of identical variable names are part of the key pair. And yeah, until now that has worked, but it may also go wrong as in this case. So when we would just use the natural join between flights two and planes, it will say, oh, we have two variables that are having the same name. So I just assume these are the key variables. So it's a compound primary key, year and tail number. Well, as I'm doing a left join, yeah, okay, we still have all, um, yeah, all, all um, flights, but yeah, there will be many NAs. And why is that? It is because the year in the flight data frame is the year of the flight, while the year in the plane's data frame is the year that the plane has been built. So it's it's something totally different, and yeah, the flights data frame only contains flights from 2013, while the planes. Well, I'm not sure if any of them were actually built in 2013, but I haven't checked. Anyway, this means that year in one in the one data frame has different meaning than the year in the other data frame. So there, it's not sensible to use them, or those variables, year variables as part of the key, of course. And, and as we have seen in the diagram, it's just tail number that is the primary key of the planes data frame. So we should just be joining using the tail number because the tail number is indeed one of the variables in the flight data frame. Okay, how should we do that? We can do that with the join by function. It's a helper function, which I think is also not uh, that's a long around, um, but so it's it's now the recommended way to specify join keys. And uh, formerly it, you would do it with a character vector, but uh, I have found that this join by helper is really really helpful and um, it's very handy to use. And we will see. So these are the six functions: so for mutating join function to filtering join function that we have seen already. They all take as their third argument, a join by expression. So let's do it. So you can just use the name of the key variable or key variables if it's compound key. If the, the key in um, yeah, the keys in the, both data frames have the same names, of course. So we just do this join by tail them, and then okay, now we have something. We have yeah, we have um, a variable with values from the planes data frame. We can also do this with weather and say, well, yeah, you know, you also added year in the natural join, but it, it's not not so 
it's not needed because the time is already completed. It, it contains the dates. So you just the, use the actual primary key, which is composed of origin and time hours. So we just make this explicit. And in effect, it's always the best to make it explicit. Um, one advantage I have found is that it just avoids the message saying, I'm joining by this and this variable. It's so annoying to have these messages all around, especially if you're working with R Markdown. So the best way to avoid that is to explicitly set the join keys. And as a bonus, you are also making your code more strict. So it's better functioning. It's you have thought about it and you are not getting unexpected results. Also for other people who read your code, it will be made explicit in this way, which key variables, variables you are using. And this is really important in a join that you are aware of these things and you, then you can check the result. So this gives still the same result as before, but by the proper, joined by the proper key. And as you can see, we get no message. So, was the syntaxis of this join by helper? Well, okay, actually, when you specify this or this in the case of uh, two key variables, it's shorthand for the variable one equal equal variable one. So actually you are always having an expression with an operator. So it allows to to name the key variable in the X data frame and the key variable in the Y data frame. So it's only when they are the same that you can just use this notation as we have used already. But so you can always use, if you will, if you like the this form and explicitly name the key variable name of the X and of the Y data frame. And of course, it's important that you can do this because they can also be different between uh, both data frames, as we will see in an example later on. Another thing is the operator. Uh, this is for equijoins, but you also have non equijoins, as we will see in a minute. So the matching conditions, which defines a match, what, what is a match between two keys. So the matching condition. It can be equality, but it can also be inequality, um, which can use uh, less than, less than, or great, or or equal, etc., and also use some helper functions that we will see. So this makes the matching rule and the key explicit. Some examples. So join airport attribute without losing flights. This means without losing flights we will use a left join again. And we use the airports as a Y data frame. Uh, airports, it has the FAA variable, but yeah, this is the, this is this type of abbreviation. And either you want to join this to the origin or you want to join this to the destination. So what we can see is, okay, we here have, we have the name of the airport, latitude, longitude, altitude, but it is the origin airport, which is being um, described by those extra variables from the airport's data frame because we have joined to the origin column. We could also do it to the destination column, which is happening here. So now you have other attributes for those same rows of the flight data frame. So it's also very important to be this explicit to know what you are joining to. Another example, let's have a look at this table with four names, which will have their own ID. We can do a self join, which means join data frame one to data frame one. So in this case, join DF to DF and well, of course, the join key is the same, but we say less than. And this means, okay, everything is a join. If in the first data frame, which is the same data frame actually, so it is the same data frame is used as X and Y and in X, the key has to be smaller than in Y, so you get 
actually all combinations. So these are the six uh, possible combinations of names. So if you want to make um, yeah, um, duels, then you have this uh, result. And so now we are getting to what are the possible matching conditions because we have uh, used this already. So perhaps just say that this diagram shows what we have just done. So it's uh, less than we are just taking these as a match. So one to three, one to two, but not one to one because one is equal to one. So we are only allowing smaller than as a match. So this is just the definition of which rows should be the match. Uh, two is smaller than three, and that's it. It's, it's equal to two and it's larger than one. So it's just these three that can happen in this, in this um, diagram. So we can have equality condition, which we will mostly use, just using the same. It's also called icky joints. The others are sometimes called non-icky joints, but it's more important to know what you are actually doing. So it's some type of inequality, typically. Uh, so smaller than, for example. You can also use rolling joints, which is a further subset of inequality joints, uh, notably only keep the closest. So in, in this diagram, it would not use this one. And for the rest, it would be the same because that was uh, it would uh, only keep this one because one is closer to two than it is to three. So this is uh, taken just the subset and it help, it uses this helper closest. And the whole other set of uh, inequality conditions, it is overlapping between intervals. So you can, in the X data frame, have a variable which you want to be between two values uh, in order to define a match. And this means that you actually need two variables in the Y data frame, then that define the lower and the upper bound of the, of the interval um, which which are typical for each row in the Y data frame. And then you make a match if X is between those two values. This is what between the between helper does. It's also just um, a helper that is that goes inside the joint join by um, the join by expression. Then you have the within, which means you have also defined an interval in the X data frame. And then you say, well, the whole interval in the X must be inside the interval that is defined in the Y data frame. While the overlaps helper, it says, well, it must overlap. So if you have an interval here, this will overlap. But it does not have to be inside uh, as a whole. You can also join without any conditions. It just means, well, make every possible combination. And that's a cross join. And it's not with the join by statement in any of the previous ones. It's just uh, by using the cross join, which is actually, it has its own purpose. It's just make the Cartesian product of all rows in X and Y. So we saw this already. And this is the cross join. So the cross join is just the Cartesian product. It's uh, also, I think, quite recent function that has been added. There are other ways to obtain the same result, actually, but this is by using the join the joining uh, framework. So let's have a look at the employee birthday case, which was uh, used in the book to use non icky joins. So the employees, we have 100 employees, each having a birthday in the year 2022. And there are four parties which are planned in 2022. And we define each party to be applicable to the birth dates that are between the start and the end date. So this, these two columns, they span the whole year 2022, 1st of January and the 31st of December. So they span, um, the whole year and 
now we want to know which employee or for each employee, when will the party for his or her birthday take place? Well, then we need a condition that says, okay, join the party dates and on condition that the birthday is between the start and the end date. So we will need a between helper. So when that's what we will see here. And this is also a good use of the unmatched argument. We say give an error in case we forget an employee or because it's an inner join, also give an error if we have a party without any employees, which would be a pity. So in effect, we get no error and we, get real, uh, we will have the result of 100 rows. So this means for every employee, uh, fortunately, there is a party and this will be the party uh, for his or her birthday. In the book, there were a few other examples uh, before this case, which, which showed that you actually need this setup to have every employee covered uh, because, yeah, um, some were um, having a birthday before the first party and then they dropped off, for example. So this is what we have there. And then this is the last slide. You can use the cross join to make all permutations of a data frame. So just do the F cross join by cross join, and you have all possible. Yeah, it's 16 rows, only the first four are shown here, but all possible permutations are shown of uh, the names. So with that, I think we have seen the overview of the contents of the chapter, but if anyone uh, would like to add some thoughts or a question, you're very welcome. I think um, joints are one of those, those mm, things that are, there's so much, right? And I, I think I the one that you use the most is the left join, but there are there are so many, right? Like like we just saw, and there are so many nuances. Like I didn't know that you could do that with the keys that you could say like key lower than the other key or combinations like that. And it never occurred to me that that was possible. So this is eye opening. But there's just so much that I feel like. Like I don't, I really don't know how to, and I use them all the time. I am just scratching the surface because <laughs> I don't, I don't even know if I understand inner join and, and the other joints. Yeah, all the the fancy joins came uh, in the last year or two. The inequality, the join by, basically. So the join by function was new, and it opens up so much. Um, all of this, like a lot of dplyr, is basically SQL for R and joins very, very much so are like directly copied from SQ, uh, SQL, which is like the database language. Um, but yeah, uh, inner join, that's, that's my, my friend. <laughs> it's very, very often useful for combining data because a lot of times you, you don't want stuff that doesn't have a match. Like that's a very common situation and it's, you know, you a lot of times what you might have ended up doing is you do a left join and then filter to get rid of NAs and inner join does both of those. So um, good to know. <laughs> ah, exactly, exactly. Like I have those things where on two lines of code. Yeah. But I can do it with one of the fancy joints. That is exactly the best example, which I do <laughs> that all the time. And then I, I end up with like five lines of code when I could have done it in two, maybe. So, yeah. yeah awesome. So, uh, I most often use the inner join because it's uh, more strict and then you, you just know in your head what you are doing and uh, <laughs> you, you require. But it was for me, it was an eye opener that you can use the unmatched is error 
um, argument to actually check that what's going on is what you expect is going on. Right. Yeah. I didn't know that yet. So <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, I, I have to yeah. rework a whole script that I have been making with many <laughs> joints and add that one yes. everywhere to check. And it's normally something that I check manually. So right. it's, it's much easier to do this. Yeah. yeah. That that one was actually new to me too. So good yeah. stuff. You can then you do anti-joins, etc., to just look or or compare the left and the inner join to see the number of rows are the same and at the other things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's just I think I need to reread the chapter and start thinking about how to use it because, <laughs> because I'm being lazy just using left join. When there are like inner join, every time I try to think about it, like my head hurts. The other thing that I liked was at the beginning, like how you started with, and I started to see like even like um, uh, a diagram. When when if I ever teach this to students or something, like if you have the if you want this, then go with this one. If you want this other thing, then think about this. And then I started thinking maybe not students, maybe me too. I need to do that diagram. <laughs> Like the very first slide that you had, because um, it helps you think, yeah, what I want is to filter data, or no, I want to create other rows or something like that. Then if I start thinking like that, then maybe I'm going to start using inner join and all the other joins. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, this, was, this was a very complicated chapter, and you explained it really well, Flores. Yeah. <laughs> You're Thank welcome. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess just a tip on a thing that you'll recognize yourself doing. If you are doing, you know, like filter um, this variable in value from other table, you can semi-join and do that pretty much automatically with less risk. Uh, and so if you are using in, <laughs> like in another table, that is, that's what semi-join does. Cause semi-join is basically just filter. Uh, it's a, a filter to match up, like it's do an inner join, but don't take the new columns. You know, it's, I don't actually want the data from the other table. I just want to use that table as my filter. So. Yes, I very use that useful. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Inner um, join. <laughs> Wait, okay, so, yeah. I'll keep it in my radar. <laughs> <laughs> and these ones, like I did a lot of SQL before R, so this stuff, it's all like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's so it's so useful because I don't know all these little commands that they put into the functions to let you, you know, like the error. Um, so good stuff. All right, uh, next week we are skipping, right? Yes, so next week is shiny comp. Uh, so at least a couple of us will be there and you know everyone is very uh very much invited to join um and then the week after uh i believe nelson is going to present so uh good stuff and we are making good progress <laughs> i will see everyone in two weeks and probably before that <laughs> yeah have a good conference i Bye. i hope I will. <laughs>